Shalom. Today we're going to continue our teaching on Pardes. We are talking about the Moedim in Pardes. We have already discussed the spring feasts, and now we're going to move on to the fall feasts. By way of review, we have noted that Pardes is a word that means garden. We have the picture of the enclosed Persian garden with every kind of delight inside, and this is how the rabbis understand the study of Torah. Pardes is an acronym in Hebrew. The Pe is for Peshat, the Resh is for Remez, the Dalit is for Drash, and the Samach is for Sod. And we've developed an English version. P is for Plain, R is for Reference or Inference, D is for Devotion, and S is for secret. So we are looking for these four levels to be seen in each of the fall feasts. In a previous study, we have covered all these spring feasts, these four levels of meaning for Passover, Pesach, unleavened bread, which is matzah in Hebrew, the first Omer, the beginning of the counting of the Omer, Omer Eshit, and the festival of weeks, which in Hebrew is Shavuot. Today we're moving on to the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah. It's a little bit difficult to talk more specifically about the four levels of these fall feasts because they have not actually totally been completed by Yeshua yet. So in that Remez, we haven't seen him complete the uh, functions of these feasts yet, but we can certainly look forward to him doing that. The uh, trumpets are blown in the Bible for many different occasions. We're going to review some of those, and as we do this, you can begin to think of, of course, the forefathers. This is their instruction and the times when they did this. Uh, what will happen when Yeshua uh, completes these functions? how these uh, relate to your own life, and we will talk some about that, and then what will happen in the uh, final years, in the final completion, in the so level. I think that for these feasts which are not completed, we might see more of a merging of the remes and the so that they might actually happen at the same time. The trumpets are blown for the moving of the camp. Numbers 10.5, when you blow an alarm, then the camps that lie in the east parts shall go forward. So when it's time to move, they blow the shofar. Uh, for when it's time to go to war. Numbers 10.9, and if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and you shall be remembered before Yahweh your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. For praise, we're commanded in the Psalms many times. Psalm 150, verse 3. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. When there is an alarm, Ezekiel 33, 3. If when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. For the gathering of an assembly to meet with Yahweh. We see this first at Sinai, Exodus 19.13. There shall not be a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet sounded long, they shall come up to the mount. And Paul tells us that this will happen again in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself shall descend with heaven, from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Messiah shall rise first. We see the trumpets blown at the crowning of the king. In 2 Kings 11.14, And when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar, as the manner was, and the princes and the trumpeters by the king. And all the people of the land rejoiced and blew with trumpets, 
and Ataliah rent her clothes and cried, Treason, treason. Again in the future, Revelation 17, 14. And these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. The King is coming, and we will hear the trumpet. For the gathering of the exiles, Isaiah 27, 13. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which are ready to perish in the land of Assyria, and the outcasts in the land of Egypt, and shall worship Yahweh in the holy mount at Jerusalem. Yeshua confirms this in Matthew twenty four thirty one, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. The trumpet is blown in judgment. Isaiah 58, 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Revelation eleven eighteen. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldst give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldst destroy them which destroy the earth. The next festival, and closely tied to Yom Truah, is atonement which is Yom HaKippurim. I know that we're used to saying Yom Kippur, but when it's spoken of in Hebrew, in Tanakh, it is always in the plural, Yom HaKippurim. And these two days are tied together as bookends around a period of 10 days. This period of 10 days, I believe, is referred to in Revelation 2.10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. I want to back up and talk just a minute about these ten days as they're seen in traditional Judaism. First of all, the day that we call Yom Truah is called by traditional Jews, Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year. It's a term that's not in Tanakh, but it came out of Babylon with the people. And uh, there is a beginning to the year at this time. It's the beginning of the civil year. We saw that it was the trumpet blowing for the crowning of the king. And so the king's years of rule are counted from this day of Yom Truah. It is the beginning of the civil year. We know the spiritual year was given by Yahweh to Moses in Nisan, the month of Passover. This is the beginning of the civil year. Between this day and the Day of Atonement, these 10 days, traditional Jewish people will be making sure that all their relationships are in good order because they understand that a day of judgment is coming on Yom Kippurim. On, they call it also the Day of Judgment. So they want to make sure that their human affairs are right so that when they meet with the Father, with Yahweh, that they can stand uprightly before him. So we have these 10 days. We understand that when we talk about trumpets, Yom Truah, that that applies to that first day. But when you go into the service, in the religious service for Yom Kippur, there is a final trumpet blast, which is called Tekiah Gedola. It's at the service of Ni'ilah, which closes Yom Kippur. It's called the closing of the gates. So there, are, there's a difference between what's referred to as the great trump and the last trump. So we're going to get into that a little bit as we go through these scriptures about Yom HaKippurim, about atonement. So here we see this trumpet, which is blown on the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 25.9 Then thou shalt cause a trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the Day of Atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all the land. So this is the beginning of the counting of the cycle for the Jubilee years, which is every 50th year. 
And we see when the last jubilee comes in Revelation 21, 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Elsewise, for this particular festival, Leviticus 16:13, And he shall put the incense upon the fire before Yahweh, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. Day of Atonement is the only day when the high priest could go into the most holy place. And this is the functions that he must do. We know that Yeshua did fulfill this in Hebrews 4:14. 4, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Yeshua the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. In Hebrews 9:11, but Messiah being come, a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, how much more shall the blood of Messiah who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So part of this function has been fulfilled in Messiah's uh, Passover atonement that he has shed his blood uh, to give a permanent atonement for all those who believe in him. Also two other things that happen on this day. Leviticus 23:27. Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. The idea of afflicting your soul is paralleled in Job with fasting, and so this is the only biblically enjoined fast in the Tanakh that on this day from sundown to sundown, we take no food and no water. This is paralleled by uh, a fast that Yeshua fasted for 40 days, and you can actually see it on the biblical calendar. We begin to move into a period of repentance the month before the seventh month, that is the sixth month. So there are 30 days in the month that we call Elul, and 10 days in the month of Tishrei, of repentance and atonement. And these are the 40 days that Yeshua spent fasting in the desert. We fast one day, he fasted for 40. In Leviticus 16.10, we talk about another ritual of the day, and that is about the scapegoat. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before Yahweh to make, him an, atone to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. So there are two goats, one which is offered live before the, in the tabernacle, and the other one which goes off into the wilderness. Yeshua actually plays both these roles. He made the sacrifice as an atonement before Yahweh, and also we see in Isaiah 53.3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As we hid, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. In Hebrews 13:12, Wherefore Yeshua also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So we see that he had to go outside the camp, the same as the scapegoat. For ourselves, we have these injunctions. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Messiah, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Messiah liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Also in Hebrews, we're commanded, Hebrews 13, 13, Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. 
So this Trump, this last Trump, which we talked a little bit about before in the context of Yom Chira, is the Trump for the resurrection of the dead. 1 Corinthians 15.52 In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last Trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Also Revelation 20.12 And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. This is at the final judgment seat of Messiah. Daniel 12.2 And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. 1 Corinthians 3.13 Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. We're going to move on now to the final of the seven feasts, and that is tabernacle. In Hebrews, it's called Sukkot. The Israelites in the wilderness were commanded to make a tabernacle for Yahweh. Exodus 25, 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. And just to mention in passing, very, very detailed instructions were given for how this tabernacle were, was to be built. And there are so many things, so much imagery that's built into that tabernacle. And there are many studies about how the parts of the tabernacle represent Yeshua. I have done a study about how they represent the human being, the different parts of the human being. Yahweh yeah, did that so that we would have this rich illustration from which to glean about what it means to have a sanctuary, to worship in a sanctuary, and to be a sanctuary. We know that Yeshua uh, tabernacled among us in John 1.14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We are the tabernacle, we are the sanctuary. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? And also in 1 Corinthians 6.19 what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? And in the future, Yeshua will return and again be that tabernacle and tabernacle with us. Revelation 21 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. While we're waiting for all these things to transpire, Remember, Tasim et Ha'inayim al Hashemayim. Keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.